Tanakoto, Tanakoto, Tanakoto Katoa. And thank you very much, Marie and the Auckland Central Library and Nicholas and the Antarctic Society for the invitation to be here. I'm going to be talking about the Erebus disaster, but I'm going to put it in the context of Antarctica and my experiences in Antarctica. Uh, and I'm going to start with a slide of my wife Heather walking the Camino de Santiago. There is a phrase that everybody who walks the Camino has heard, and that is, everybody's Camino is different. Well, everybody's Erebus experience is different. So this is just the view from one person's experience of uh, being in Antarctica at the time, uh, taking a very small part uh, in, in the overall story of Erebus. So what led to my interest in Antarctica? Um, well, very briefly, the person here, as you're looking at him on the left, led to my interest in Antarctica. The person on the right is Ed Hillary. Uh, this picture was taken by a New Zealander, George Lowe, uh, on the Transantarctic Expedition. Uh, and in 1962, uh, when I was 18 years old, uh, this person, then uh, he was just Bunny Fuchs, when he came to South Africa when I was 18 years old and lectured at the University of the Witwatersrand, he was Sir Vivian Fuchs. And he gave a compelling lecture about the Transantarctic Expedition. Um, and he was very modest. And he said, oh, you know, I'm going to show you some pictures. Uh, and they're not very good. And then he proceeded to show pictures and they're just, you know, these orange snow cats falling into deep blue crevasses. I was instantly hooked. And, oh, I wanted to go to Antarctica. Uh, I, you know, from that moment on, um, early 1962, I knew I wanted to go to Antarctica. The problem was I didn't know how. Anyway, a puzzling choice. How did I get to go to Antarctica? Well, on... Uh, the 3rd of February, 1979, Heathers and my four-year-old son slept in, which was extremely unusual for a four-year-old on a Saturday morning. And we were reading the newspaper in bed. And uh, this is an advertisement that appeared in the Christchurch Press. You see, I could be an archivist. You know, I keep things like this. <laughs> I went and found my uh, original advertisement. And Heather drew my attention and said, oh, here's how you might be able to get to Antarctica. They want an information officer photographer at Scott Base for the 79-80 summer. I thought, ah, I said to Heather, I'd never get it. And she replied with some of the truest words she's ever said. Well, if you don't apply, you won't get it. And so, yep, that's dead right. So I did apply, and the archivist in me still has the original letter I typed out um, asking uh, uh, for the job. And I explained in quite uh, a lot of detail my journalistic experience. Uh, but the most important thing, as it turned out, that I said in the letter of application was, I am a keen amateur photographer. I have an Olympus OM-1 35mm camera and several lenses a darkroom at home, and I do my own black and white work. Copies of my photograph have been published in etc., etc. Little did I know that one of the things that the Arctic Division of the DSIR was very keen to get was somebody who was better at photography than some of my predecessors had been. And Colin Monteith apparently said at the selection committee meeting when they were making a shortlist, ah, here at last is somebody who'll know one end of a camera from another. And that was a crucial phrase that led to me getting to Antarctica. Um, and as a result, uh, my name was published as having been chosen when the list of uh, nominees came out. The Evening Post in Wellington wrote an editorial, not quite a thundering editorial, but saying that it was a puzzling choice. Um, and uh, wanting to know why a senior lecturer in political science had been appointed uh, to the position and ending, uh, and if the nature of the work of information officers has been substantially changed, as Mr. Roberts' assignment suggests, the DSI sh uh, should explain why the change has been made. On the face of it, the uh, appointment doesn't make sense. <laughs> um, the uh, superintendent of the Antarctic Division of the DSIR, 
uh, Bob Thompson, had to spend a day justifying to the minister, Bill Birch, why I'd been appointed. He was very angry <laughs> that this had happened. And he, he said to me, Nigel, don't ever let this happen again. Well, I hadn't let it happen, but they stuck with me. And the next thing that happened was that uh, we went to Tekapo. Uh, and Tekapo was all the people who were going to go to Antarctica went for a week's training course at the army base at Tekapo. And I came back from a week's training at Tekapo, and people said to me, what did you learn? Uh, and I said, I learned how to fight fires. Uh, because one of the things that they've really stressed at Tekapo for people going to Antarctica is, and particularly for people being based at Scott Base, was you know, there's no fire brigade, uh, there's no water to put out a fire. You've got to be extremely fire conscious. Another thing I did, was uh, one of the first phot photographic tasks I had at, at the Tekapo training course in August was to take everybody's photograph. It was great for an introduction to who was going to go to, uh, to Antarctica, all the different scientific parties, uh, the base leadership. Uh, at home, uh, I got a request for, uh, I had to be measured for the Antarctic clothing I was going to be uh, taking from the DSIR's stores. And, um, some of my honours students, and one of them, had a friend who worked in the Antarctic Division of the DSIR. And in the corridor of the political science department, this appeared overnight. <laughs> a stuffed a daily penguin with the Nigel S. Roberts travelling fund and a few coins in a, in, a, in a cup. And this was put up outside the department. Because um, it wasn't only the Evening Post that thought it was puzzling that I was going to Antarctica. Some of my students thought if it was puzzling, it was certainly funny. Um, then, to get to Scott Base, I still remember the date. The 16th of October, 1979. Uh, out at uh, Christchurch Airport, and here's a group of us uh, waiting uh, to catch... And this was a very good lesson, because one of the things you have to learn about Antarctica is there's a lot of waiting. Um, you are waiting to get a flight, and it may not come because of weather, it may not come because of uh, different commitments. You learn to wait, you learn to be patient. Uh, here, uh, incidentally, is Keith Woodford. Keith went on to a very distinguished career as an agricultural economist at Lincoln College. Uh, and uh, he had, prior to this, a few years earlier, he'd been leader of the 1977 New Zealand Everest expedition. Um, and I got to know Keith quite well and really enjoyed his company. Then uh, we walked across the tarmac and uh, uh, boarded a Starlifter a C-141. Then it was about a five and a half hour flight. When you land in Antarctica, wow, I still remember the moment I stepped outside the plane. Uh, I remember the temperature. It was minus 23 degrees Celsius. And the first thing I remember, because you're all kitted up, you've got your mucklacks on, you've got your uh, uh, you know, very, very good clothing. So you're, you're not going to die of exposure walking across to the uh, vehicle to get in the vehicle and go to Scott Base. What I do remember is instantly the water vapour in my nostrils froze. Uh, yeah, it was brilliant, you know, what they call a, a, a bluebird day, just utterly clear skies. Um, and then you go on an ice road because this plane has landed on the ice runway. Uh, this is on two metre uh, thick ice uh, and uh, during uh, the early summer wheeled planes can land on the ice runway. Uh, and they have to eventually stop landing on the ice runway when seals start popping up for a, a breath of fresh air in, in the runway. Uh, but here is the roadway, uh, New Zealand Antarctic Programme. Uh, you see there is a control tower, a radar, and behind it uh, you've got a view of Mount Erebus. And we're taken up to Scott Base. So then uh, Scott Base is here, uh, on uh, the p peninsula here uh, on Ross, Ross Island. Uh, between Scott Base and McMurdo, there is Observation Hill. Uh, and the wonderful thing about the location of these two bases is that they're very near the permanent shelf ice uh, and the uh, uh, water that, of course, has temporary sea ice on it. 
And so uh, that's why uh, in the, in the uh, early part of the season, the planes can land on the sea ice and then move over onto the shelf ice, uh, in which, of course, they have to fl uh, flatten the uh, permanent ice of the ice shelf. Um, just to loc locate here, you can see, yes, as Marie has already mentioned, the two mountains, the two very big volcanoes, uh, Mount Erebus and Mount Terra uh, uh, on Ross Island, a smaller Mount Terra Nova in between. Just to put it into perspective, Mount Erebus is higher than Mount Cook. Uh, uh, both are over 3,700 meters high, um, and Erebus is slightly higher of the two. And you get an uh, understanding as to why it so dominates the scenery. This very large volcano slap in the middle of Ross Island. Well, Ross Island was named after James Clark Ross, uh, the commander of the two ships, the Erebus and the Terror, that in uh, January 1841 were in the Antarctic. In fact, it was originally given the wonderful name of Burning Mountain, uh, and um, it was decided uh, to call it by Ross. Erebus and Terror after the ships. And this is the very well-known painting that was done a few years later by an artist who didn't witness the scene, but imagined them here in New Zealand uh, in about August 1841. Of course, the name Erebus uh, is, and here's the definition from the um, uh, Webster Dictionary, a personification of darkness in Greek mythology, a place of darkness in the underworld on the way to Hades. Of course, that came for New Zealanders to really resonate as the true meaning of Erebus. Well, living at Scott Base, I just thought I'd show you a little bit of what like, the Scott Base was like uh, 40 years ago. Um, many of the original huts from uh, the time that Scott Base was founded and set up in 1957 were still there. Uh, this is a view of Scott Base and looking uh, from behind the base at some of the snow that has piled up and it's uh, wind-driven snow. Antarctica, I should just say, is the world's highest continent. The average height uh, of Antarctica is higher than any other average height in any continent. It's the world's coldest continent and it's the world's driest continent. There's very little fresh pre uh, precipitation. Most of the snow in Antarctica is wind-blown snow that is blown from one part to another. And here you can see that the wind-blown snow is bulked up against the accommodation block. Uh, this is looking over to White Island that sticks up out of the ice shelf. Now, on the other hand, not every day is like this. Uh, here is another view uh, that I took of Scott Base during a storm. Uh, and this was a storm where you, uh, I had to actually get permission to go outside. I said, I'm just going outside very briefly to take a few photographs. Uh, but this was a storm that you know, basically everybody was confined to base for the day. Uh, the winds were about 80 kilometers an hour and uh, the sound was uh, amazing because usually Antarctica is very quiet. One thing that when I look at what has happened in Antarctica since I was there that is really important is the changes in our environmental consciousness. Because here we have two outflow pipes uh, that you know, the wastewater, the toilet effluent, uh, was just came straight out and formed what was jokingly called after Bob Thompson, the superintendent of the Antarctic Division. Uh, his initials were RBT, and so this was known as the RBT Glacier. Uh, and uh, being a hard-working photographer and uh, dedicated to telling the truth, I went outside and stood in the snow to get a picture of some of the effluent actually coming straight out down from the toilets and the ablutions block and coming out. And of course, you know, now we know so much more. Our consciousness of keeping Antarctica pristine has gone up immensely. Um, the huts were all separate. And they're separate because if there's a fire, you want to retain or contain the fire to one of the huts. And the, uh, joining the huts were what were called the covered ways, which was just corrugated iron bent over uh, wooden slats and weren't heated. So you got, went from one hut to another through the, uh, through the covered ways. 
The hut that was the main focus of a, for a lot of people was the mess. And this picture of the mess is taken uh, on, uh, on Christmas Day. Uh, the leader uh, of the, the summer was uh, Mike Preble, uh, and he's up at the head of the table there. Cass Roper, the winter over leader, was here. Uh, I can't see. Oh, hiding up there is um, uh, the um, deputy leader, uh, Ted Robinson. This is how we got our water. You uh, went and collected ice, put it into an ice melter, and shoved it into uh, a um, diesel-powered uh, um, furnace that melted the ice. And of course, it looks all right. Here's Mark Sinclair doing it on a nice sunny day, wearing only um, his swan dry. Uh, it was much worse if you were doing it in conditions like that. And so, in 1979, for the first time uh, at Scott Base, they installed a, a reverse osmosis plant. And this was for taking seawater and taking the salt out of seawater by reverse osmosis. Uh, and as Scott Base is right next to the sea, uh, the way we got the seawater was they blasted a hole in the ice dropped a pipe down into it, uh, so it was underwater, and then took the water up to the base. And that was a huge improvement. So suddenly at Scott Base, after I'd been there about five weeks, we went from being able to have a shower a week and having uh, to be very, very careful when you uh, flushed waste away down the toilet to suddenly being quite profligate. There was now water, uh, thanks to the reverse osmosis. Very popular part of Scott Base was the bar. Uh, Many hours were spent in the evening. The ablutions block was um, uh, gender neutral. Uh, as you can see, you just came up and uh, washed your face in the morning um, w w when you could get a space at the uh, basins. Um, and uh, one of the problems with the ablutions block was sometimes it didn't work very well and uh, the base engineers were often literally in the poo. Uh, there was the post office. It's hard to find a post office in New Zealand now. Well, Scott Base had a post office with four employees. And Leo Slattery, who was the postmaster in 1979-80, he, it was his third trip to Antarctica. He, it was a previous winter over a, a few years earlier. Uh, he's virtually looking at the information office of photographer's cubbyhole, which was also in the post office. And so the view that poor Leo had uh, was me um, when I was working at uh, my typewriter in the little uh, alcove I had in the post office. This is what the uh, bunk rooms were like for Scott based staff, the summer staff. We shared uh, rooms, uh, but you know, there were only two people in them. Uh, I had the upper bunk, and I have to say, out of the window was a view like I've never had in any house I've ever lived in, and that was my view out the window. Of course, one of the problems with the view out the window is that it's permanent daylight. Um, even in uh, mid-October, the light when the sun had gone down, as it did for a few weeks below the horizon, uh, was still uh, so bright that you um, had to do something. So uh, I was lucky I'd inherited a little piece of plywood that exactly fitted over the window. And I didn't ever suffer from what people in Antarctica know of as the big eye, where you know, you're wide awake because you're at two in the morning, it's bright and sunny. Um, and so I luckily didn't have that, but what a view. And here, of course, is the, from my bedroom window, Mount Erebus and smoke coming out of the crater. Well, working in Antarctica, my job was information officer photographer. Um, I was there to go around to largely take photographs. Nothing generally, till Erebus, was groundbreaking news. So a lot of the work I did was doing feature stories. And often feature stories, what made them interesting were the photographs. So I spent a lot of time in, in Antarctica. Uh, sometimes with three Olympus OM1s around my neck. Uh, the Antarctic Division's black and white, which is they particularly wanted me to use their black and white. That was what was being used to illustrate stories uh, in New Zealand newspapers. Um, my own Olympus OM1, in which I had Ag Agfa Chrome color film, and 
Occasionally, but not very often, Antarctic Division's OM-1 was colour film in. Um, I was, it was said to me, don't take any more pictures of penguins. Um, they had enough pictures of penguins. But, for example, they said, do take pictures of the McMurdo Sound mist uh, sediment and tectonics uh, studies. Do take pictures of the installation of the reverse osmosis plant. Because, so I would take colour pictures of those. But they, by and large, didn't want many new colour pictures. So most often, as in this picture of me, I was wandering around with two cameras around my neck. I occasionally had three cameras. And the first thing I had to do after cleaning out the darkroom was go on a survival training course. Everybody had to do a survival training course. This is not a picture on the one I was on, but here's one of the three New Zealand's uh, survival trainers, uh, mountaineers from New Zealand. This is Daryl Thompson. And one of the many quid pro quos between New Zealand and Antarctica is that New Zealand says to the United States, New Zealand and the United States, sorry, New Zealand says to the United States, okay, you can have space at Harewood to be able to get to Antarctica. Operation Deep Freeze can be run out of New Zealand. A quid pro quo is that we get flights to and from Antarctica with you, and we get flights within Antarctica. Another quid pro quo is, well, in return, we will do the survival training. So Americans, and in this picture there were some Americans who were being trained by New Zealand trained mountaineers who were training the American staff in techniques of surviving. And this is you know, how to pull an injured person up out of a crevasse. Um, then after I had um, uh, passed the survival training course and learned how to uh, uh, live in an igloo, um, my centre off on my first assignment. And my first assignment was to go, and I stopped and I went and I said, hang on, I want to go and take a picture, a, an artistic picture through um, the um, sastrugi of the, what we call the flower wagon. I mean, we called it the flower wagon because uh, somebody had painted it over the winter with these uh, uh, flower pictures on. And this was going on the road that was marked with flags, the way, rather the route, uh, from uh, Scott Base through to the uh, Mists Drilling Rig, the biggest program we had on the ice that year and has been very dominant. I really like this because you know, it's not like going to the local Bunnings or the local Z service station and hiring a trailer. The trailer, of course, has skis and pull it behind you. Um, this is the Mists Drilling Rig in 1979. And interestingly, it looked one way and you got this great view of Mount Erebus you walked over to here and stood here and looked the other way and behind you could see uh, Mount Discovery. Uh, and uh, uh, you get these very different perspectives but the stunning scenery all around you. And um, it was while I was at Mists, um, oh, that I wrote my first story uh, about the mist, and this was uh, quickly taken up, you see the, um, Monday, October the 29th in the Christchurch Star. I would say that one of the things was because Antarctic Division was, and Antarctica, Antarctica New Zealand still is, based in um, uh, Christchurch, the Christchurch papers, more than any other papers, the Christchurch Star and the Christchurch Press, were most likely to take the stories that I wrote, sent back to Scott Base, and they distributed. That's the, my favourite picture of Erebus that I took. Uh, I just drew the, with the Alpine glow on it, um, and it was such a stunningly beautiful mountain. And I have to say that I always like to think of Erebus like this rather than in tragic terms. Although another photograph I've taken on Erebus is much more famous, this is the one that I really like. And just to give you some idea of the beauty, also connected with Erebus, uh, one of the glaciers coming down off Erebus, the Erebus Glacier, comes out, flows over uh, the land of Ross Island, and then carries on out to sea, and it's the glacier floating on the sea. Uh, and it's called a glacier tongue. And at the end of the glacier tongue, the Erebus Glacier Tongue, when I was there, was the most amazing ice cave. And to go into that ice cave, and just look at that amazing blue was again, as this is probably this and the previous picture were the two, my own two personal favorites uh, that I took all the time I was in Antarctica, a place of 
indescribable beauty. Well, the stories I wrote, some I didn't have to step out of the base. In 1979, there was a medical study to see if they could reduce cold-like infections by giving everybody iodine-soaked handkerchiefs, uh, paper handkerchiefs, and you had to carry these around and use only them, and the blood was taken in advance, and it became a very successful test. Um, I could go a little bit further than just saying in the base, and this is a University of Canterbury zoology camp, and they were doing uh, studies of the fish uh, just off the uh, uh, coast. And so you went onto the sea ice, they drilled a hole. I love this because the, uh, the two wanigans, the, uh, the two huts, were uh, used for the cooking and for the laboratory. People slept in tents, as I did when I, I went out there and visited them. And people then say, well, what about the toilet? The toilet was the, this igloo. And contrary to expectations, the fact that the red flag is up means it is free. Because, of course, with the flag being up, you can go, and you took the flag with you into the igloo. And then when there was no flag, it meant you didn't go. You know, and at first I thought, well, hang on, the flag up, a red flag up. No, no it was quite the opposite. And apparently it's still the case in Antarctica. And this is the type of story I would write for them. This is a feature story with various photographs. I went to cover the opening of Vanda. Vanda is, uh, was New Zealand's second base in the dry valleys. Uh, and uh, together with uh, Ted Robinson, the deputy leader at Scott Base, uh, we went over and we're congratulating the leader of Vanda, Gary Lewis, and the two people who were based there for the summer. And then a story was appeared uh, of using one of my photographs uh, this again is the Christchurch star. Banda, I should say, was used also because it's in the dry valleys. Uh, this picture was taken in January. The temperature was a tropical uh, plus five degrees Celsius. Uh, you can see we're having breakfast in our shirt sleeves. Gary is actually wearing a t-shirt. And it was used for R&R. &R. Scott-based staff there for four months were given a few days over at Banda. And it was a really lovely place to go. In 1979, we had one, what we called, ironically, deep field expedition, because this is the least like a field you'll see. Uh, we had a team of geologists go to the Ohio range, and uh, base leader, Mike Preble, said to me, Nigel, this is one thing you certainly have to cover. What is a deep field expedition? It's beyond helicopter range. And we had to go out in a ski-equipped Hercules, uh, and we went out twice, because the first time we went out, we couldn't land. Uh, yeah, the winds were so strong, the crevasses in the area that they thought they could land were so big, we went back to Scott Base. Seven hours after leaving Scott Base, we slunk in, uh, especially as some had put in the visitor's book back in January, or the intentions book. The second time we went out, uh, we landed successfully. This was a great expedition. There were four people on it, and it was a mixed expedition in two ways. Uh, there were two men and two women. The leader was Margaret Bradshaw, a uh, geologist who worked in the uh, Christchurch uh, Museum, and the field leader was uh, Graham Ayres, who was the son of Harry Ayres, the mountaineer who basically taught Hillary his craft on um, uh, Mount Cook, and Harriers had been with Hillary in Antarctica in the original establishment of Scott Base. So this was just a wonderful continuity. It was a mixed in another way. There were two New Zealanders and two Americans. We flew for three hours down to the Ohio range, landed to land. The plane landed on full power with its skis on the ground and doing what's called a touch and go. So it came down and landed and then took off and then circled over to see if the landing had broken open any crevasses. It hadn't, we came back and landed properly. The um, engines weren't turned off, it moved forward, down the ramp came the skidoos, down the ramp came the uh, equipment, uh, the uh, sleds that the skidoos pulled, and then Graham, the field leader, had to establish radio contact with another base. Anywhere, as long as we knew the radio was working, and then I got back into the plane, and I left four people I'd been uh, very close to for about 10 days. 
and we took off and left them there for two months. I have to say, there were tears in my eyes as I watched these tiny dots uh, left on the polar plateau, uh, uh, far closer to South Pole Station. Uh, it was an amazing expedition.